Okay, so our scripture lesson of today is Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. And that's found in your few Bibles on page 1440. That's uh, 1440, 1,444 of your few Bibles, 25 to 34. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any... Can any one of you, be, uh, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Amen. Amen. There was a businessman who ran into his old friend who was a stockbroker, and uh, the man always had problems with ulcers and high blood pressure and, and things of that nature, and so he asked him, how's your health? And the man replied, great, my ulcers are gone, and I don't have a worry in the world. The man asked, how did this happen? The stockbroker said, it's easy. I hired a professional worrier. Whenever something comes along that I need to worry about, I tell him about it, and he does all the worrying for me. The businessman couldn't believe what he was listening to. That's incredible. I'd be interested in something like that. How much does it cost? The stockbroker said, he charges about $100,000 a year. The businessman said, how in the world can you afford to pay him $100,000 a year? The stockbroker said, I don't know. I let him worry about that. <laughs> We wish it was that easy, right? <laughs> to have somebody worry about us and not even worry about how we're going to pay them. But in real life, we know, of course, that we have many concerns, many worries. We worry about finances, about our health, about our family. Uh, we're concerned about, this, of course, this horrible pandemic that's going on. And it, we're so bad at worrying that, think about it, we even worry about the fact that we're worrying too much. You start thinking, oh, God, why, why am I worrying so much? You know, it's something that's just amazing. Um, there was a poll that came out and talked about the things that we worry about. It said, 40% of the things that we worry about will never happen. That is so true. How many times we feel pain, we have a thing, oh, no, i got to have cancer, this is wrong with me. We go to the doctor, it's like, oh, you have gas. Yeah? <laughs> it's like, you know, we worry so much about and we worry about it and think about it and think about it. You know? 30% of things about the, in the past that we cannot change. We actually worry about things. Think about how many times you think about something in the past and you start worrying about it. What can you do about it? Nothing. It's gone. 12% is about things that, about criticism that come from others. Even if it's mostly untrue, it doesn't matter. Uh, we still worry about what people are saying about us. 10% is our health. I was shocked about that one, to tell you the truth. I thought like 75% would be health. <laughs> but 10% is about health. I guess we only worry about health is uh, if we feel something wrong with our body or we begin to stress about it. And 8% is only about the real things, the real problems that we do have to face in life. And so this passage is very important because it teaches us not to allow ourselves uh, to be paralyzed by worries. And that's what it does. Matthew Henry in his commentary says, This one thing of worry can make us stale and ineffective. It must be overcome if one is to be useful for the Lord. Uh, we have to overcome worry. But now, let me give a little 
Side note, because when people hear the word worry, they think, oh, I'm all, you know, is he saying that this is all about this? I'm, I'm not trusting God because of worry. No, the word worry here is not talking about simply the concerns of life. Sometimes we think about, oh, I got to get this done or I got to get that done or how am I going to manage to pay for this? All those thoughts come to our mind. You know, I remember when I was in Bible college, I was always taught, let the Bible interpret itself. That's how you begin. And if you look at this passage and you study the life of Paul like I have, uh, Paul constantly says, I'm concerned about the churches. I'm concerned about Titus. He has to come back. I'm concerned about this. You know, he gets concerned about things, but they're not things that overwhelm him. They're not things that put a mistrust of God into his mind. The worry that is being spoke about is a deep-seated worry. A deep-seated worry that calls into question the goodness of God. That calls into question the provision of God. That God will take care of me. You know, it begins to say, God doesn't love me. God won't rescue me. God won't take care of this. When you hear those things being recited in your mind, that is worry. That is when you're crossing the line into something that is not good. But we see the Father's provisions. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you wear. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothes? When you see the word therefore, you have to say, what is, what is it there for? And it's therefore to point us back to a passage previous to this, which was talking about where is your treasure? Anybody, anybody hot in here? Yes, yes. I'm hot in here. Uh, you know? I'm going through a stage in my life. I need cold. I don't feel good. You know how to turn on? Yeah. Blast the cold, man. Blast the cold. Thank you. So difficult. And my breathing is not great to begin with. Thank you so much, brother. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's talking about where we put our treasure. Do you put your treasure in heaven or do you put your treasure in things of this world? Because where you put your treasure, that's where the Lord is, where your Lord is. So if your Lord is the real Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, then your treasures are in heaven. Then you're focused on things of heaven. Then, of course, things of this world will not overwhelm you. You will not be as anxious about them. Again, consume with anxieties. That's what it means. The actual, the, the word comes from, Greek, from a Greek word that means to be divided. That you're divided between Christ and something else. Instead of trusting Christ and believing in Christ and believing that he'll take care of it, um, you're, you're, trusting, you're not trusting. You're thinking things are going to go wrong. And that kind of division is not good. Now, of course, the passage is not telling us, hey, don't worry about not working. Don't worry about, you know, some people might come to this passage and go, hey, I like this passage. You know, their lazy bones are going, awesome. You know, some people are so lazy, really. How lazy are they? They're so lazy that I, I wonder sometimes how they get out of bed. You know, it's like, oh, God will provide. What they mean by that is I'm not going to go to work. I'm not going to do anything. Well, I don't even know why they get up to eat. Why doesn't God just bring the meal to your bed? Why doesn't he just, you know, don't go to the supermarket. God will bring it to your house. It's amazing how, you know, but that's not what it means. It means your priorities have to be straight. God first. Put God first. Then other things will take care of themselves. Make your relationship with God your priority. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have, you, you're not concerned about the things of this world. On the contrary, the Bible endorses, it stresses the importance of working. 2 Thessalonians 3.10, Paul says, For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. Whoa, harsh. But not harsh because people were just being lazy. And living off others, living off other Christians. I remember one time we were in, uh, as young people, I must have been 16, 17 years old. We were in a park, Hudson County Park there. And uh, uh, a, a, a gentleman that was homeless came up to us. And he wanted food. He wanted, you know, he found out we were Christian sauce with our Bibles. He starts quoting scripture left and right. And I, and so, of course, you know, and then he talks about, he starts quoting scriptures about the importance of taking care of the poor and feeding the hungry and clothing the naked. And in the midst of all this, I said, yeah, the Bible says those who don't eat, don't work, don't, work, don't eat. My, some of my friends were not happy with that. <laughs> I was like, this guy's using the word of God so he can just get a free meal. You know, he's not using the word. You know, it's true, we should help the poor. It's true, we should help the... But when somebody's actually quoting scripture to use it against you, it's like, that means that they want to live off other people. No, Bible endorses work. We're supposed to work hard for the Lord and work hard in the job that we have. The Bible encourages us not to squander, not to be frivolous in things we have. On the contrary, it says, 
earn your living, save your money, so that you can be a blessing not only to your family, but also to others who have needs. And of course, to support the work of the Lord in the ministry of God. You know, the Bible is constantly encouraging us to work. But we should not be unduly concerned with the material things of this world. Don't overstress. Don't get bombarded with the world and the ways of the world. And he gives two beautiful illustrations. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. You know? It's awesome. You never see a bird walking around smoking a cigarette going, going, how am I going to take care of this? How am I going to take care of this? I don't have enough seeds. i got to find seeds. I gotta... You never see a bird stressing. On the contrary, they're always looking to see who, who's throwing out free bread, who's throwing out something, you know? They love the fact that we have this fountain here. This is their free water, free bath. They love this stuff. On the contrary, we shut it up. They're looking around like, hey, hey, what happened? You know, who, sh who shut it off? Who didn't pay the bill? You know, come on. Uh, so, I mean, they're not worried. And look at the flowers. Look at, you know, and why do you worry about clothes? Now, does this mostly go to women or to men? You know? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. The glory of the beauty of things. And it says, you know, God cares about you. And he says, are you not much more valuable than they? Wow, what a rebuke. If God takes care of his creation, he does such a wonderful job. You think that you, who are the pinnacle of God's creation, because you are created in the image of God, that he's going to neglect you? That he's not going to take care of you? Absolutely not. He is. You know? And this one I love. Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? On the contrary, worrying medically, we know, takes away hours from your life. It's been shown that people that have anxiety, have stress, that going through those things, actually their life is shortened because the, and the people that are more peaceful, more joyous, you know, and actually ultimately Christian, <laughs> that's what they mean, or they'll say religious because also other religious people are, they're more calm and they live longer and happier lives. So this is, this is important. But here is where we see that it's not simply Jesus giving us a suggestion and saying this may be good advice, it's a command. In verse 33, it's a command. It says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. That's the command. That's not a suggestion. It's not like, if you want to seek his kingdom first, that's a good idea. No, no. Seek his kingdom first. Make that your priority. Not your bank account, not your status, not your ego, not your honor. The kingdom of God first. Put that in the list first. You know, non-believers run after these things. Non-believers are worried about these things. Non-believers make everything else number one in their life except God. That can't be with Christians. I mean, it's sad we see Christians that are making everything number one in their lives other than God. And again, it's not impossible because Christians are stupid like anybody else and Christians sin like anybody else. We mess up just too. And sometimes we get caught up in the wave of the world. The world is constantly bombarding us with ads and this and that and you need this and you need that. If you're not up to the status of the Jones, you're not good enough, you have to surpass the Jones, constantly coming at us. You know, at the very top of our list has to be God and everything else falls in place. The great missionary J. Hudson Taylor uh, said it this way, let us give up our work, our plans, ourselves, our lives, our loved ones, our influence, our all, right into God's hands. And then when we have given all over to him, there will be nothing left for us to be troubled about. Put everything into God's hands. Take care of God's business, and he will take care of your business. He will take care of your family. He'll take care of things. But we have to seek, and the seek here is a present tense, which means constantly doing Determined, deliberate, diligent, seeking after the things of God. Put God first and everything will fall in place. Uh, Clay Krause has a wonderful song entitled, I Surrender All. In there he says, if the source of my ambition is the treasure I obtain, if I measure my successes on a scale of earthly gain, if the focus of my vision is the status I attain, my accomplishments are worthless and my efforts are in vain. So I lay aside these trophies to pursue a higher crown. And should you choose some, somehow to use the life I willingly lay down, I surrender all my triumph, for it's only for your grace. I relinquish, relinquish all the glory, I surrender all the praise. 
to give everything to God. Jesus Christ does not, won't not, will not ever play second fiddle. If you think that Jesus can be second in your life, you are completely mistaken. He will never play second fiddle. So if that's where you're trying to put him, he's not in your life. It's that simple, unfortunately. If you tell him, wait second place, he'll be, when you turn around, he won't be there. You know, it'll be like Samson having neglected the things of God then wondering where the strength of God is. Well, you gave it up. You gave it up time and time again. And then finally, you, you know, actually, actually one of the saddest things I've ever read in the Bible is by Samson. You know, I used to love Samson when I was a little boy. Of course, I used to have long hair. And, and I love Samson. But the saddest verse has to be, it says that the Holy Spirit left him and he did not know it. How sad can that be? Can you imagine the Holy Spirit walks out on you and you don't notice the difference? That's how bad had God in his life. And that's how bad it gets in some Christian's life that they're neglecting so much the things of God that God walks out and they don't even realize that God has walked out. We need to be committed to Christ. We need to enthrone Christ and keep Christ in the center of our lives and number one in our lives. Um, again, this promise is not for everybody. This promise is for those who are committed to Christ. You know, again, if you're, seek, if, you're seeking, if you're seeking to establish your own empire or your own thing, don't be surprised that Christ is not there to help you to establish your business or your empire or whatever because you've neglected him. But when you put him first, you know, every time you see people who talk about their success, oh, da, 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 and they talk about how the Lord did it, because, and they always tell you God was number one in my life. Prayer was number one. The word was number one. Doing all these things were number one. Same thing here. We have to put Christ first in order to be successful in all these other things. In one of the earliest Greek manuscripts, there's a record of a man whose name was Tidideus Amerimnos, if you're wondering where the title of the sermon came from, Amerimnos. The first part of the name is just a proper name like John, Joe, Mike. But the second name is, is made up of a Greek word for worry, Merimnos, it means worry in Greek. And we put the prefix as not worry. He was a guy who, as a non-Christian, was worried about everything. He was concerned about everything. But when he became a Christian, he didn't worry about anything at all. And so he changed his name to Amerimnas. I thought, that's pretty cool. Yeah? George Amerimnas. Yeah? But why was he not worried? It wasn't because he was an idiot. You know, some people don't worry because they're idiots and don't take concern about life. Or they don't really care about what's going to happen. They think, ah, kissara, sara. Or they give one of these cliches, like, I love people that don't go to church, don't have anything to do with God, and yet something happens, says, God will take care of it. Really? <laughs> Which God? <laughs> you know? But no, it's not that. Those who don't have that worry are people who have put their faith in God, the God of the Bible, the God who raised Jesus from the dead. We trust him. We trust him in his sovereignty. He will take care of things. He will watch over us. He will provide for us. He is good. He turns all things that can go bad into good. This is a great God. We can trust him. You know, that's the pillow that we need to lie down on. You know, when we need to rest and make sure everything's fine, trust him. You know, of course, the enemy's going to come quickly, quickly. You know, oh, no, you can't trust him. You can't trust him. How many times did he fail you? I remember and try to bring up stupid things. Say, you know, you, know, you got to do it. You know, the, on the contrary, that's what God wants you to do. God wants you to show that you are independent. I love when the, the devil comes like that. You know, it says, no, what God really wants for you is for you to grow up and to be on your own. And to not rely upon him. No, 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 no. That's not growing up. That's called Lucifer. <laughs> That's called sinning. That's called going against God. We are supposed to depend upon God. We're supposed to trust him every moment of every day. We are to trust him for everything. Think about it. When the Bible says, give us this day, right, our daily bread. It doesn't say, give us this week our daily bread. Give us this month our daily bread. No, give us this day. Day by day, we rely upon God. And yet we know that we go to the supermarket and we buy the bread. Or someone brings it to a house for us. We know that. And yet, we still pray, give us this day our daily bread. We're still relying upon him every single day to take care of us. Jesus says, you know, every day has troubles of its own. That's a promise. <laughs> every day has troubles. Every day is going to have trouble. He's not lying to you. But don't carry today's troubles into tomorrow. And don't bring tomorrow's troubles into today. Trust the Lord. Trust Him for all these things. And again, 
to have that kind of sense of trusting in him for everything in our lives. Verse 34 says, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has its own troubles. We need to rely upon him. Don't carry the things of yesterday today. Take every single day into the hands of God. You know, every time we face situations where there's room to worry, don't look at it as like, oh, now I get a chance to fail. Now I get a chance to mess up. No, it's an opportunity to be faithful. It's an opportunity to trust. It's an opportunity to let God be a blessing in your life, to really stop. I remember when I was uh, going, now, now, I'm, now I'm just suffering a bit, but not as bad as I did when I first got this. I was in pain. I was in pain. I was just horrific. I had a pain in my back that I was like, at times you were like, God, you know, since I, I wasn't taking any painkillers. I actually gave up painkillers because I found that they were not helping me. They're actually just hiding the pain and I was not getting better. So I gave up the painkillers, bright eyes, and uh, <laughs> I'm there in agonizing pain and it had made me trust in God. I kept calling out to God. I could have gotten angry, but why? I just called out to him to help me. I knew that partially the reason I'm in the state that I am, because I'm a, you know, when I was young, I had accidents, I had things that happened to me. It was not God's fault. God didn't do this to me, but I'm calling out to him. But it, it gave me the opportunity to stop, you know, be still. Know that I am God. You know, it gave me that opportunity to, to practice my favorite verse, you know. Be still. Know that I'm God. You know? And as every day got better and better, as I healed more and more, I was like, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. But the enemy always comes. He will come. As soon as you begin to have that financial problem, he'll come. As soon as you can't pay your mortgage, he'll come. As soon as, as, soon as you have a problem with a co-worker, he'll come. As soon as you have a problem with your spouse, he'll come. Every single opportunity that he can take, he will take to come in and to make you doubt to make you, put you, try to put you back into bondage. And at that point, you have to set yourself free from that and know that it is the enemy and lean completely upon the Lord, you know? And when the devil's trying to bother you that way, you know, bother him back, you know? I remember uh, singer Carmen say, when the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future, you know? Don't let the enemy bring you down. As Christians, we know that the Lord is with us. The Lord will provide. He's giving us these words telling us, don't worry. Don't worry. I'm here. I'll take care of it. Just trust me. Do my business, and I'll do your business. Take care of my stuff, and I'll take care of your stuff. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your great love and mercy. We thank you, Father, for always providing for us, for always guiding us. We thank you, Lord, that even when things look so difficult, we know that you are there, that, you know, indeed, as Paul says, to live is Christ and to die is gain. There is nothing in this world that's going to take our hope and our faith in you, Father. Guide us, bless us, Lord, that we will not be in turmoil as the people of this world are in turmoil, constantly being concerned about so many things, running so many different directions, Lord, and yet not solving anything, but to be able to trust you, to wait for you, knowing that you have provided and you will continue to provide for us. We thank you and we bless you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, our closing hymn is very easy. Mm -hmm. Amazing grace. I really hope you guys know it. Amen. Um, so we'll be doing verses 1, 3, and 4.
fierce toils and snares I have already come this grace that brought me safe thus far and grace will Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the peace and fellowship of his Holy Spirit go with us until we meet again. Amen. Praise God from